Thanks. Now, I know that like, my first task is to get us out so that we can have the cocktails before the other people. So, uh, so I'm a fake programmer. I'm going to talk about stuff. Let's get started. Um, so, like, I mean, what does it even mean? What, what, what is this even, right? Because, you know, people have talked about object-oriented programming. People have talked about library-oriented programming. People have talked about protocol-oriented programming. People have talked about functional programming, which I suppose is like function-oriented programming. And, so, you know, like, I mean, the, the, even these change, these terms change from, like, you know, from day to day, from year to year. If you look at, like, the August 1981 Byte magazine, which is where they, like, you know, released small talk to the world, object-oriented meant garbage collected. It meant that the memory management system was oriented to the, you know, to the size of the objects that were in your program. It meant that you had a memory management system that knew how big things were that you were using and that it would automatically allocate them and free them uh, you know, as you used them and as you discarded them. Um, and the programming, the kind of, yeah, the programming paradigm, if you like, the thought process was called message-oriented programming. So now we've got object-oriented, message-oriented, which are apparently the same thing. We've got uh, functional programming, which is like not oriented. We've got protocol oriented, which is just the same data types as object oriented programming, but Apple need a new term because they, you know, they have to claim that they've invented everything. Uh, <laughs> we've, you know, we've got uh, library oriented programming from Justin. Like, what, what's going on here? I mean, is this about like the tools that we're using? Is this about, you know, if I use Java? No, let's not go there. Um, so, <laughs> so if I use like Objective C, am I automatically object oriented? So how how about if I use Objective C and only use C functions and primitive data types and structs and unions? Am I still object oriented? Because I'm using an object oriented programming language, right? If I like you know if I use Swift, then am I automatically Functional? Is everybody else dysfunctional? You know, this is like the kind of, you know, the Ash like siloing, the us versus them. You know, am I doing a? Does my use of a thing mean that I am one of us, and your lack of use of that thing mean that you're one of them? I mean, if you like found two Swift programmers and asked them, how do you do this thing? One of them would go, oh yeah, monads, functions, woo, bind, awesome, and the other one would go, well, I just you know, uh, create my class or my struct if I think it's a value and then I'd you know, add properties to that. Where's the you know where's the commonality of orientation there? Like you know what what is it that you think is being oriented and in what direction? Let's let's try and pin down, you know, because like there's no better or more valuable discussion than nitpicking over the meanings of words, right? Like uh, yeah, we're all we're all programmers. We can all identify with this. Uh, so, well, I'm not, but you are all programmers. Um, so, let's let's go for this kind of like paradigmatic approach. Well, that's a, that's a good word, uh, partly because it's got like extra consonants that you don't pronounce, like Lester does. So it, it instantly discounts all the Americans from the conversation because they're like, "What? I have to go to Leicester to understand this?" and uh, you know, but uh, it's also a kind of like Italianish word, and we're in Italy, so like let's go with that one. Paradigm kind of means a thought process, a way of thinking about stuff. So, what we're orienting isn't our program, it isn't our source code. It's our our way of thought. Now, I was talking uh, to Maxim earlier about um, painting and art. Now, do do you get? people who are watercolor artists and people who are acrylic artists or oil artists. Yes, you do. You don't get people who say, well, I'm a watercolor painter. We all know that uh, in the watercolor world, portraits are considered harmful. Therefore, you, you can only use watercolor paints to paint landscapes. You cannot possibly even conceive of doing a portrait because of like the whole mutable face problem. It just it just doesn't work. You know that's like not a conversation that happens because you know thinking about you know how I see your face and how I see the colours and the shapes and you know how I 
choose to interpret that is something that I can do independently of choosing a medium in which to express that thought. Now, of course, the medium has uh, you know, certain kind of mechanical uh, details. So the medium is going to dictate how like, the strokes mix in with each other, whether like, some of the paint goes on top of the other, where it, whether it kind of merges in and becomes you know, a, a kind of combined color, uh, how long it takes to dry. So therefore, like, you know, what happens is I layer other strokes on top, all of these kinds of things. But it, that's how I translate my view of your face onto a canvas. That's not how I visualize your face in the first place, right? So, uh, so it, this can't possibly have anything to do with our choice of language. By the time you have gone, right, I'm going to sit at, well, ooh, no, not at that computer. By the time you've gone, I'm going to sit at a computer and you know, code up the solution to this problem, I would like to hope that you've at least thought about the problem to some extent and have got some idea of what the solution is going to look like. And that's all abstract. That's all kind of high level. Indeed, programming is you know, the art of high level thinking about a problem and then translating that into the low level mechanics you, uh, that is going to express the solution in a way that a computer can run using whatever model of computation uh, you want to uh, express that, uh, that solution. Let's have a look at a couple of specific examples. Uh, so I want to start with, um, with functional programming. I've kind of talked about all this stuff. There we go. So given a point that's expressed on a Cartesian plane with x and y coordinates, I want to be able to uh, find the distance of that from the origin and the angle that the point makes from the x-axis. Uh, and I'm going to use functional programming, and I'm going to use the rules from functional programming. Now, I've got two tasks to do, so it seems like I might want two functions. Now, in order to kind of get out of all of this nonsense about arguing about programming languages, I'm not going to use any programming languages. This is, well, it's kind of vaguely uh, Z, which is just a mathematical notation. but what it says is that I have a function called point radius which ha takes a float and a float and it returns a float and the, the specific implementation of point radius is that it returns the result of that maths, right? Uh, and the same for the angle. Now, we can see a bunch of problems here. Um, I'm going to start with something that uh, Justin was talking about earlier. He was talking about uh, coupling and about how libraries can help uh, to reduce coupling. The opposite of coupling, the flip side, you know, to use the Kent Beck, the Kent Beck trade-off emoji, which is that. Uh, you know, the, the opposite of coupling is cohesion. This is not a very cohesive solution. I have this thing, which is called a point. Uh, and I have two different things I want to do. So I've created two completely different and unrelated functions. How do I guarantee that people are going to use you know, the float and the float here to mean x and y in one instance and x and y in the other instance when these two interfaces are not at all correlated and all of the information that you're given is that you need a pair of floats? Like, that's just not... Uh, guaranteed to work to a a any sense. You know, they, it's it's a, a possible point of confusion. I'm going to use a tool from the functional programming toolbox in order to address this problem. I'm going to use a tool uh, that's quite common to uh, functional decomposition. It's the idea of pattern matching. The idea that a function can have different implementations of its algorithm based on pattern matching on its inputs. So I've got these two different things I want to do, a radius and an ang angle. I can enumerate that collection of stuff. I have the radius operation and the angle operation. So I could enumerate that operation and pattern match on it. So here we go. Now I've got a, a single function, which means that I know that people are going to use the arguments in one way because there's only one entry point. And it takes a float and a float and an operation, and it returns a float. And so we'll pattern match on the operation. If you Give it x, y, and a radius, it will do the radius calculation. If you give it x, y, and an angle, it will give you the angle calculation. This is, you know, that was just a single uh, 
use of a functional programming trick that's you know, quite common in languages like Swift and Haskell and so on. Now I can use another functional programming trick because th this isn't particularly extensible. Everything that happens here has to return a float. What if I wanted to do something else? What if I wanted to transform the coordinate system and return another point? Uh, I, I can't do that. What if I wanted to return a string description? I can't do that. What if I had a function that's going to take another argument? Well, I can't do that because I've only got float, float, and operation. So uh, I can use another functional programming trick in order to make this even more uh, extensible and generic. I can use higher order functions. I can use a function that returns a function. So let's have a look at that. So now I take my float, my float, my operation, and I return a function. So now my radius, when I pattern match on the radius, I return the radius function, and then evaluating that gives me the radius of the point. Same with the angle, and then I can add other cases for other operations. I just want to tidy this uh, up a bit. So my third trick from the programmer's tool chest of functional programming is uh, the tool from Lambda Calculus, the partial application. I can say that this function, which takes three uh, arguments and returns a function, is actually a function that returns a function that returns a function that returns a function, using this uh, partial application technique, which consumes uh, and effectively encapsulates the earlier arguments, returning a function that has closed over them and will use them in subsequent calculations. So that gets us to here. So now I have this point function that takes two floats. It returns a function that takes a selector and returns what I'm going to now call a method. So I've used all of the tools of functional programming. And what I've got is a thing that can construct an instance of a class of things that when they receive a message that contains a selector, chooses an appropriate method to execute as a result of that message. This is functional programming. Classes, instances, selectors, and methods. Functional programming. We agree, right? I mean, you know, no tricks up my sleeve. All I've done is to uh, take a function pattern match on its input, and then partially apply its arguments. And I've got this thing here that encapsulates some secret data. We'll call it instance variables. <laughs> so this thing, this right-hand part, this function that takes an operation, a, a selector, and returns a method, is just a function that encapsulates its instance variables and responds to messages. Encapsulation, instance variables, classes, instances, selectors, messages. This is functional programming. Just like make another point here. If I created another function which works exactly the same up here, so it takes different data. The, the left-hand side is different. Let's say it takes the magnitude and the angle, so r and theta. But it returns a thing which also consumes selectors and returns methods. I would then have, because we're using like a nice functional type system, like the Hindley-Milner type system, I would then have a thing which has exactly the same type as this and could be used wherever this is used. So polymorphism. I would, I would have two constructors of different classes that both respond to the same selectors and so give me interchangeable, call them objects if you like. So now, so now I've got, uh, what have I got? I've got encapsulation, I've got uh, message sending with selectors, I've got instance variables, I've got classes, and I've got uh, polymorphic objects. Functional programming. Well, I'm glad that you're all happy with that. I can, you know, I, I, I can hear the general agreement uh, from the audience or stony silence, it's one of the two. <laughs> and you know, now I want to look at something else. Um, I want to look at object-oriented programming. So imagine, like, you know, obviously, uh, object-oriented programming is used for 
uh, building large-scale systems. Functional programming is used for building monad tutorials. So uh, I'm going to look at something a bit bigger for an object-oriented programming example. I'm going to look at a compiler. Imagine I had some definition of a source language, and I want to you know, take that and optionally build an executable if it's like valid uh, in the syntax of my source language and return an error and like not generate an executable if the syntax uh, can't be passed. So we're going to use object-oriented te techniques here. Uh, so here's my first go. You know, uh, it captures all of the important nouns and verbs from the thing. So I was de from the problem specification, so I'm definitely using my UML style uh, you know, use case driven object oriented programming techniques here, which we all remember from like the uh, Jacobson books in the 1990s. Um, his first name was Ivar, which is great. I think, I think C programmers called him Field Jacobson, but uh, anyway. Um, so we've got one method. This is a public method called compile. It takes a string and maybe gives me an executable back. And then I can look at the errors as well with this accessor. Now, this is, this is all kinds of weird, this example, really. Like, particularly, let's look at the coupling between these two methods. If I don't call the compile method, what does get errors do? If I call the compile method and it succeeds, what does get errors do? If I, compile, if I call the compile method and it fails, and then I call the compile method and it succeeds, what does get errors do? None of this is clear from this interface. Um, so it also like, violates one of the object-oriented design principles called tell, don't ask, uh, which is where you don't kind of find out, you don't like poke into an object to find out what its state is. You uh, get it to tell you when interesting things happen. Uh, so let's use the tell, don't ask principle here to create an error reporter object that's essentially a consumer. It gets, uh, it, it receives an error, and it doesn't do it, it. It doesn't return you anything. It just like does whatever it needs to do. It prints it to the console. It makes an angry red triangle in Xcode. It you know tells HR wh whatever it is that you need to do when your programmer like, makes a mistake. <laughs> and now the the compiler has a single method which uh, consumes the source string and the thing that it needs to report errors to, so this kind of error sync, and maybe returns an executable. It's starting to look better. It's certainly like, easier to understand. You know, one might almost say reason about uh, what's going on here. But there's still a problem. Like, what, are, what happens when you compile an executable? There's a bunch of different stuff, right? You know, we, have, we have to like, look at the syntax of the... Uh, source language and try and match the text in the source string to the tokens in that language. Then we have to like, you know, build some kind of representation of that in like an abstract machine. And then we need to turn that into the, uh, the executable language of the target machine. And then we need to build an actual executable that's in a format that an operating system can read. So there's a lot of different things uh, that could potentially be happening. And that means that there's a lot of different reasons for this object to change. Um, if I am on ARM and I want to like, you know, do the time warp and go back to PowerPC, then I have to change this compiler. If I want to add you know, dot syntax to my property lookup in my, uh, in my source language, I have to change the compiler. If I want to stop using the Marco executable format and I want to use the ELF executable format instead, I have to change my compiler. Now, the object-oriented programming uh, principles include the uh, single responsibility principle, that an object should have one and only one reason to change. And this has got multiple reasons to change. So let's kind of break it out a bit. So, so now I've got a tokenizer that has a tokenized method and optionally returns a tokenized source. And then the tokenized source can be used by the compiler, which has a compile method. And that puts assembly out, which can be used in the assemble method of the assembler and then in the link method of the linker. Now, this is a bit weird because what we've got now is we've got a bunch of classes that are all called verba. And they all have a method called verb. And what each one does is 
consumes some input and returns some output. So they each have exactly one function because we followed the single responsibility principle. They don't uh, maintain any internal state because we use the dependency inversion principle to put, the, uh, to put all of the state into the arguments. And then they just like, so they are simply maps from their input values onto output values. Which means that effectively each one of these is just a single uh, and pure function. Now I'm going to need something else. I'm going to need a binder that can bind anything. So any function that takes a T and a U and returns an optional V and anything that takes a V and a U and returns an optional W, I need some kind of thing to bind those together in order that I can put the output of this into the output of that and then kind of compose in a, you know, in a sequence the various functions that are on these, uh, on these classes. So uh, what have we got here? We've got um, pure maps from input to output. We've got uh, compositions of chains of these, uh, of, of these pure uh, transitions. Um, we've got object-oriented programming. I mean, like, you know, I, I didn't do anything else. I used the solid principles, and I uh, used the tell-don't-ask principles. So I used good, so, uh, well, indeed solid, object engineering rules. And what I get is an object is an object-oriented solution made of a composed sequence of functions. In the same way, I used the functional programming rules earlier to get my classes of objects that enclose their instance variables and responds to messages. It's obvious how completely different functional programming and object-oriented programming are when you follow the different rules for them for these examples and end up in two completely different places. In fact, it seems more like uh, object-oriented programming is what happens when you follow the rules of functional programming. And uh, functional programming is what happens when you follow the rules of object-oriented programming. I hope I didn't break it. Right, I uh, should have plenty of time for questions, but you might want cocktails instead, I don't know. Uh, thank you for the talk. I wholeheartedly agree with this Thing that basically functional programming and and what you showed as uh, object-oriented programming uh, are trying to achieve, they are trying basically to achieve the same thing. I think the problem with object-oriented programming is the fact that uh, if you, for example, considered yes in the solid as you did the single responsibility, it's so vague that sometimes, uh, actually a lot of times, uh, people. Uh, think that the single responsibility is something completely different, you are not going to end up with objects like those. You're going to end up with uh, you know, big collections of methods that also uh, mutate the object. So um, um, my, my, point, my question is, uh, what do you think um, about the state of object-oriented programming today? And uh, do you think it's, uh, you know, it's similar to what you showed there? First, let me acknowledge the pun inherent in the state of object-oriented programming. Uh, that was some good work. Uh, no, I mean, like, you know, I was kind of like deliberately driving the rules hard in order to demonstrate that, yeah, both of these things are doing uh, solving exactly the same problem. And the reason is that they both use exactly the same expression of the problem as their kind of you know source for inspiration. So in 
1968, Doug McElroy wrote about uh, the industrialization of like the software, well, industry, I suppose, but it wasn't an industry back then. You know, he was saying it was like this. And he's actually saying it's like, like this kind of you know collection of uh, indies in their cottages, like all doing you know handcrafted artisanal bespoke work and not actually like you know working together, not you know all sharing their their source and their findings and working as a collective, uh, you know, academic and intellectual community. Luckily, things have moved on a lot since then. Um, but his point was, like, what you need in order to have a kind of, you know, a mature uh, industry of software engineering is that you need components where, you know, I can look at a catalogue of components and go, right, what I need is, like, you know, like a quick sort, like uh, Chris showed us. Um, and I need to be able to use it from the Swift language, and it needs to have like you know the, these runtime constraints and these memory constraints and whatever. Um, and I should be able to just like you know pick and choose those and plug them together, and build my solution out of that. Or rather, I should be able to sell components. Like we as programmers would sell components, and uh, you know end users would assemble things out of them. Or there would be like people who would build larger assemblies out of these components and then end users could plug those together in order to build the applications they need, you know, which is basically what AppleScript and Automator uh, do. They are at that level of, uh, you know, of kind of end user composition. And the, so the functional programming people came up with the idea of, uh, you know, being able to kind of interchange and compose functions. And essentially all that happens in object-oriented programming there's a couple of different ways to look at it. One is that object-oriented programming is just about message passing. It's just about late runtime resolution of the function that you want to run. So if you uh, look back at uh, you know at this uh, functional thing here, the the operation that consumes a selector and returns a method is all that Alan Kay cares about in object-oriented programming. That is to him object-oriented programming. But then what happened was um, Java, basically. Uh, Java took its inspiration from a couple of places. One is Objective-C because Sun hired a bunch of like uh, programmers from Next in the you know in the early 90s uh, when they were working on this, um, and the other is Barbara Liskov and her work on abstract data types and the Clue language. Um, so the classes and the objects and the kind of rules for inheritance and covariance and contravariance and all that nonsense in Java come from not an object-oriented world where everything is an object and you just like look up stuff at runtime in YOLO. Uh, it's from this kind of you know, more mathematically inclined abstract data type world which builds all of those constraints. And it's when you've got those constraints alongside single inheritance you then got all of the problems that you get with ha like having to do interface segregation, with having to like you know not being able to uh, couple things if one of them requires you to subclass, and then preferring composition and all of that stuff. So all of the kind of rules of modern object-oriented programming, if you like, come from the you know the single huge spark in its uh, pop popularity which was the launch of Java in the 1990s, correlated with the rise of the web, which is weird because we don't use Java on the web anymore. But that launched a thing that wasn't the same as the object-oriented programming that had existed before, but co-opted the name. So no, object-oriented programming as practiced, to use Gary Bernhardt's phrase, doesn't match object-oriented programming as pre presented here. Any more questions? Hi. Um, in your last slide, you say that um, you have to bring your own thinking. And you showed how you can actually shape uh, a language and do basically whatever you like. You program in any paradigm you like. Uh, on the other side, do you think that a language can shape the way you, you reason, the way you think in a way? Because for instance, I don't know, uh, NS array doesn't have a map method, so it's not idiomatic. To well, do it does, it has enumerate objects using block, which... Uh, uh, or in, fact, yeah. in fact, no, uh, value for key, uh, an NS array value for key path is your map function. 
Yeah. Uh, except it, for the fact that it allows you to return nil, which makes it a bit weird and not truly semantically the same as map. But yeah, it, it does the have them, yeah, that's but what I mean. like <laughs> Apple like using more words, or rather Next like likes using more words. Um, so it can, const it can both uh, kind of constrain the things that you think of. You know, if you've been doing like small talk programming for you know, 30 years, you're unlikely to go, I know I need like a, uh, a strict compile time type system and a bunch of types defined, and I need a bunch of uh, you know, functions that are going to map from type to type, because you're going to, go, you're going to have been thinking about objects for three decades, and that's going to be natural. Um, it can, so it, it's going to like lead your thought based on your experience. There's, um, I don't know, I'm not going to mess with the computer now. I had enough trouble with it. Like if, imagine, imagine you have a matrix. Like you can represent your computer program, the, you know, the, your software that you're going to write as a matrix, and we'll put all of the type constructors along the row, of, along the columns, and we'll put all of the operations along the rows. So you might have like int, float, point, employee, and you might have like add, subtract, give pay rise, describe, uh, down here. Now, object orient, it w however you write your software, what you're going to do is fill in that matrix, right? You're going to say, I need to be able to do this thing to this type, therefore I need a hole, in, you know, I need to fill in this hole here. In object-oriented programming, what you'd do is you would look at the columns first and you go, right, so for the int type, I need to add and I need to divide and I don't need to give a pay rise and I do need to describe. And for the float type, I add and I divide and I don't give pay rise and I do describe. And for an employee, I don't add and I don't divide and I do give a pay rise, if you're lucky, and, <laughs> and I do describe. And then... Um, Functional programming goes through the other way, it, and it tries. To, it goes right. This is the operation I want. Now let me pattern match on the constructors that were passed to me to work out which version of this operation I'm going to use. So I'm in the add. If I've been given ints, then I'll use this version. If I've been given floats, I'll use that version. And so they're both like they're both decomposing the same problem, but in orthogonal ways. Um, and so whichever one you've been like you know most exposed to or thinking about recently you're going to choose that way to, uh, to slice the pie. Um, and then, like, you know, in all of those cases, you're going to go, well, add and divide are things that I want to be able to do to more than one type. Therefore, I'll, like, pull the rules of those out into something that I'm either going to call a protocol or a superclass or a type class, depending on which one it is that my language gives. But, like, inheritance is, again, orthogonal to to like that kind of pie slicing approach. So the the inheritance stuff that appears to be part of object oriented programming is actually you know equally valid in functional programming. Thank you. Good talk. Thank you. Um books. What books should I read to get like good information about this kind of stuff? This, um, the, the main source of, like, the main kind of flash of inspiration for doing this uh, was two papers that I read. One by uh, a guy called Ade Reddy at Birmingham University from some point in the 80s, I think, um, which is called Objects as Closures. So if we go back to the, you know, the thing I built with the, uh, these points and the function that takes the instance variables, returns the selector, returns the methods. Imagine that I built those out of closures in Smalltalk or in Objective-C. I've now got objects that are masquerading as functions. And I use those functions to build objects. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, you know, that, I mean, that, it, it's kind of turtles all the way down. And, like, you know, um, he made this point that, uh, that you can think of an object as uh, essentially a pure function. And this is why, um, this is why Smalltalk doesn't look like it has a type system. It's because if all of your objects are a function from selector to method, then they all have the same type, even in like the strong type system of the Z notation or Haskell or whatever. Like they are absolutely interchangeable. Um, so there was that paper, and then um, the other one that was kind of like not directly related to anything on this 
uh, presentation, but did kind of get me thinking about this stuff, was one called uh, Theorems for Free by Philip Wadler. Um, I'm looking at Chris to know where... Uh, yeah, he's nodding, so he, uh, <laughs> it, must, it must be clever. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and that was from what? That was like 89 or something, I think. Um, and you know, he showed that when you've got the type system, uh, you can derive certain truth. When people say like functional programming helps you reason about your code, when like a mathematician or a computer scientist says that, what they mean is there are fundamental truths you can derive from the from the function signature. So, uh, you know, consider like the quicksort function that Chris showed earlier. It takes an array of a and returns an array of a. And if you just, if all you know about A is that, then you know that you can't apply any operations to A because you don't know what operations it has. And so that's why he wasn't able to implement the quicksort. He had to implement quicksort of A extends comparable array of those to array of those. Now, what I also know is given that signature, given array of A extends comparable to array of A extends comparable, um, I know that I can compare stuff, and I know that I can take elements from the first array, uh, from the input, and I can reorder them in an, the output, I can drop them from the output. I can't create new instances of A, so I can't possibly return any new A's, because I don't have a constructor or any operations that let me get a new A. I only have the comparable ones, which let me get Boolean information based on two of them. So that means that I know that if I've got the array you know, 2, 1, 3, 17, or whatever it was, I cannot get the number 9 in the output because I don't have numbers. I can't do maths. Pretty good answer. Could you please read these uh, two papers later for everyone? So, uh, Read, read out the references again. Yeah, thank No, no, t tweet them maybe. Oh, so tweet them. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary Talk. I have a quick question for you. Why are we always late in adopting stuff? For example, you mentioned object and object oriented programming that has been created by Alan Kay in in the 70s and small talk, and then we have functional programming that has been there for least PML, and then Haskell in the 90s. Why are we are 20 years, always 20 years late? Uh, oh, no, 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 not 20 years, because Alan Kay got object-oriented programming from Simula, which is like 1963. Um, and also from, the, and this is a kind of 30. Cool, this yeah. is a kind of cool and weird story. Um, there was a tape loader for an operating system on, a, on an old like mainframe computer where the the first like block on the tape told you the uh, locations on the tape of the other operations by name so if you were like trying to you know load an employee then you l read this table in you looked up the load employee name then you looked up that location on the tape. Then you go to that location, spool in the code, and then you run that. So this tape system in like the end of the 50s had an object-oriented dispatch system as its table of contents on the on the tape drive. So, you know, two decades is peanuts to computer science. Like, you know, we're kind of three, four, five decades is is a reasonable time to wait for anything to happen. It's I, I don't have a clear answer. I mean, it, it looks like you need the, the, the kind of marketing and the promotion to be there. Like, you know, the, the idea that if someone has a good idea, then the industry will pick it up is nonsense. I mean, Kent Beck didn't invent TDD. Kent Beck rediscovered TDD and then wrote a book about it. And at a time when Smalltalk was popular and there were lots of Smalltalk pro programmers, and then they, when Smalltalk stopped being popular, decided that they still liked having jobs and money and mortgages and stuff. And so they went to other environments like Java and Ruby. And so like, you know, all of the kind of Alastair Coburn, Martin Fowler, Kent Beck, Bo Bob Martin, you know, anyone you've, a any like white middle-aged guy with a belly that you've heard of from the Agile Manifesto <laughs> was, you know, w was in this small community that then became like the kind of foundational movement of this bigger community. And we see that in Cocoa as well. Like, you know, um, Marcus here has got the occasional gray hair. 
And you know, there's uh, plenty of people here who said, like, I've been using Objective-C for 10 years. We had like the tweets from Will Shipley where he said, like, in 1989, I saw this Objective-C stuff and decided everybody should be using it. And these were the people who were you know, the kind of the trendsetters. And it, you know, it's trends, it's fashion, let's not, let's not mince words. It's all about fashion. These were the people who were defining the fashion of the iOS uh, programming experience from the from the beginning. So then when you had this much bigger crowd of people coming in, you know, you've got people coming in, was it like 2009 when they first had core data on the phone? 2010 maybe, it was like iPhone 3, wasn't it? Um, so like, you know, they come along and they go, well, I need, I, I need to learn how to use this stuff. I'll look to Marcus, because he's been doing it since 2005. And so that's when the you know the, the that group of people that like community became much bigger and so the things that Marcus had been doing for years already suddenly became the the focus for this new and larger group of people same with TDD same with object oriented programming it's what we're starting to see now with functional programming as well is that the people who are in like the kind of Glasgow acad academic community went screw this I can make more money out in the real world, and they'll go, right, I want a job at Microsoft, you know, bringing monads to Visual Basic. And so they, they go to Microsoft and they create Link, or they go, I want to, you know, prove that this can work at scale. And so, like, Simon Marlow goes and works at Facebook and does, like, spam filtering in Haskell. And so that's why the functional programming concepts are becoming popular now, because the intersection of the people who know about it and the wider community has finally uh, has finally become a reality. Yeah. Thank you.